Welcome to Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp, president of Sharp Research and Translation. Our show today is uh, Make It the Indo-Asia, Indo-Pacific Region. And our guest is Ambassador James F. Moriarty, uh, who is the former U.S. Ambassador to Nepal and Bangladesh. During his uh, State Department career, he also had uh, tours in Northeast Asia and was also highly conversant with Southeast Asia. Welcome to Think Tech Asia. Bill, glad to be here. Great, great. Well, the, should it be the Asia-Pacific region or should it be the Indo-Pacific region? I think it needs to be the Indo-Pacific region because when you say the Asia-Pacific region, people forget that if you look at the rebalance to Asia and the future of U.S. relations with Asia, the Indian Ocean is a huge part of it. And I think people get used to saying Asia Pacific and because of previous thought patterns, uh, they assume it stops someplace around the Straits of Malacca. Let's, uh, um, if we could put that map up, I think this would help our, our viewers. Okay, there we go. We get a pretty good shot of the region. Uh, we can see the Pacific. I don't think we can quite see Hawaii on there, but we know it's out there in the middle of the Pacific. <laughs> Uh, we see the Russian Far East, Northeast Asia, Japan, the Koreas, China, Southeast Asia, and then over there in the southeastern part of the, the map, uh, we see the subcontinent. And of course, as you mentioned, the Indian Ocean. It's a huge area, isn't it? It's a huge area. And you know, there are some organizations that have always tried to include it. Uh, for example, the Pacific Command right here. Mm -hmm obviously has a area of responsibility that runs up to the outside of the African border. Basically, most of the Indian Ocean okay. belongs to the Pacific Command. Uh, so they have, for a long time, tried to think more broadly. But most organizations in Washington aren't, don't divide their work up that way. Well, let's come back to that. But, okay, you mentioned the rebalance, and I see you prefer the term rebalance rather than pivot. I think we all agree on that. Now. Why is that, though? Because some of, our, uh, some of our listeners might be a little confused about that. Well, particularly for somebody who worked in both the uh, George W. Bush and Obama administrations, it sort of implies that somehow uh, Asia had gotten totally left behind. Mm. Rebal the pivot phrase. Okay. The rebalance phrase is a good one because what it means is that as Asia becomes more and more important, you're seeing more and more focus on Asia by the U.S. government, but frankly also by U.S. business, by U.S. universities. Mm. Uh, so what you're seeing is a whole bunch of disparate American organizations, a, a whole of society approach, beginning to acknowledge that, hey, you know, Asia is where it's happening, and we've got to focus more on it. And that's, that's why it's not a pivot. It's not the previous... Uh, administrations ignored it. It's just that the reality of the increasing economic weight, the increasing political weight of the region requires that people focus on it more. Okay, good. Um, perception, as you mentioned. Um, how do you change this perception? I mean, there are definitely some people that have some pretty fixed views on it. It's the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, how do you change that? You know, frankly, the nomenclature isn't important as long as the, the people, whether it's in the academia or business or government, begin to realize that sort of artificially saying we're just concentrating on things east of the Straits of Malacca is not in their interest. Mm -hmm. They begin to realize that, hey, look, you know, the Indian subcontinent is one of the faster growing areas economically in the world, and soon... India will become the most populous country in the world. Right, right. Uh, and it will this year become the fastest growing major country in the world. So you put that all together, and, the, and there's got to be a recognition that the focus can't stop at that artificial line. I, I mean, we really have great hopes with Prime Minister Modi, don't we? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, he invited President Obama there for India, uh, what do they call it, India Republic, Republic Day. Day yeah. Um, he visited Washington previously. They seem to get along very well. Uh, we, we really have great hopes for India. Uh, and he, he seems to be a pretty aggressive fellow, too. Mm -hmm. 
He uh, is the first Indian prime minister in decades who is not leading a coalition. In other words, he doesn't rely on anybody outside his own party, and mm. he doesn't have to. Uh, if you look at the history of various Congress governments and also opposition governments, they have been hamstrung by smaller parties that will frequently start going in a totally different direction from what the governing party, the core of the coalition, really wanted. Mm. Uh, and it made governing India pretty difficult. Mm. Modi is not bound by those constraints. And more importantly, like you said, he's got a vision. You know, he wants to accomplish things. He wants to make India take off, is right. what he uses. Right. You know, you're talking about the difficulty of governing India. I, I mean, <laughs> India is difficult to govern no matter what, it seems exactly. to me. I, I have a f I've been to India a few times, and it, it seems to me, well, China, which you know well, is complex, but India is really <laughs> complex. It's even more complex, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so disparate. Every state is like another nation. Um, it's, it's really challenging. It is very challenging. It's sort of a uh, the ultimate endorsement and condemnation of a federal system in the sense that you've got all these states. You have, I think it's 350 spoken languages. We get well over 300 languages. English is the lingua franca, even though Hindi is supposedly the main language, because the southerners will be darned if they're going to speak Hindi, right, just right. to ple please the northerners. Right. Uh, it's, and yet it hangs together and it continues to make progress. It, it, it's really amazing. It's, um, I, I know some people criticize Indian democracy, saying, well, it's called democracy, but it's not really. But then on the other hand, it, it seems to me that its system of elections and parliamentary government and English, as you mentioned, is really holding India together. And like I said, it's making progress. It's building national institutions where there really weren't any before. Mm. Uh, you know, a very wise former uh, deputy prime minister of Pakistan in the early 1950s warned that Pakistan needed to build its future institutions on the repeated exercise of democracy. Now, for a variety of reasons, that hasn't worked out all that well. Right, in fact, right. you just had your first peaceful transition uh, from one elected government to another in Pakistan's history. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas Indians go to the polls, and right. every time they go to the polls, everybody will tell you it's the world's largest democratic exercise. Yeah, four or five hundred million people going out to vote. It's it's, it's very impressive. My my sense is that the uh, Indian judicial system too is is not bad. I mean, especially for a country that is as large as India, as has had such struggles with poverty as India has had. And unlike many countries uh, in the region, it has not seen politics sort of color everything that it does. It will take decisions that outrage the ruling party. Mm. Uh, it, at the highest level, the Supreme Court has, very clearly has all the independence it needs. Uh, it will listen to, they call them a public public interest litigation. Mm -hmm. uh, people can just file suits saying, hey, you know, something's wrong with the way this country runs. Uh, you know, in, it was about t 10 years ago that the Supreme Court said that New Delhi's air was so dangerous that you could no longer have things done the way they were. And I think at that point, they specifically mandated that all the taxis had to be natural, run on natural gas as opposed to uh, petrol or diesel. And they are, aren't they? And they are now. Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. those... Um, that, that was a Supreme Court decision. I, I call them toot-toots uh, that, mm -hmm. that run around New Delhi, the green and yellow buggies. <laughs> They're all natural gas as far as I know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. You, you mentioned something interesting, too, that um, I, I think maybe we should just vis visit on, revisit it for a second is that um, Modi is the first prime minister who could ro rule solely on the power of his party and didn't have mm -hmm. to accommodate a coalition. It's also another way of saying that the Congress party is past its prime, isn't it? It's, it's fading away. It's not what it was. It's, it's not what it was. Uh, the dynasty is in trouble. Raul, the, the next one who was supposed to be taking over the mantle, doesn't seem to have it. 
And more importantly, uh, Congress has sort of lost its ability to enthuse the masses. Mm. Uh, they had charismatic leaders before, they don't now. Uh, basically what you see every election is Congress trying to come up with programs that will buy off its traditional constituencies. Mm. Mm. Well, you know, getting back to this idea of the Indo-Pacific region, um, could a change in perception in any way hurt the United States? I don't see how, oh, maybe I'm not being creative enough here, but the reality is... Trying to look on both sides of this. Ev even if we don't see it that way, increasingly the world sees it that way. I think you've probably had people talking to you about China's maritime Silk Road. Sure. What's that? Sure. It's their game plan for the Indo-Pacific. Right. Uh, you also look at the facts on the ground. I mean, if India was trading with... ASEAN as a collective rather than individual countries, mm -hmm. it would be large, India's largest trading partner, mm. just above China, mm. and we're at the third. So, right. you know, it's, uh, the flows are beginning. India has uh, active East policy. You know, you, That's a good point. Yeah. You see that they're reaching out to the East. Uh, Modi has incredibly good relations with Prime Minister Abe, building on the works of previous Japanese and Indian governments. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you probably noticed that uh, President Obama and Prime Minister Modi uh, came out and very clearly talked about freedom of navigation in the South China Seas. Right. So these are all things that are going to happen no matter what uh, the strategic experts in Washington call it. It, it is true, isn't it? That, uh, could we put that map up again? Okay, and um, we'll get that in just a minute. But it is true that India is not confining its influence to South Asia. It is reaching around, as you said, to ASEAN. It's reaching around to the South China Sea. It um, has a very active, ongoing relationship with Japan. Uh, I understand that um, in, in talking to folks in Taiwan, that there have been several high-level Indian defense um, missions visiting Taiwan. It's a, it's, it's, its interests go beyond just South Asia. Yes, and, you know, if you could go back to the map. Okay, there we go. Yeah, there you go. Uh, you see, it has a border with the big neighbor to the north, too. The big neighbor to the north, right. Uh, and, you know, with a rapidly rising China, India's strategic equation has to figure out how it factors in a China that is not only rapidly growing economically, but rapidly growing militarily, and vis-a-vis -vis most of its neighbors has adopted a fairly aggressive stance on territorial and sovereignty issues. And again, if you look at that map, uh, much of that border with India is disputed. Right. And it's that's never a, been settled. That's, that's a good point. That was a good point. I like the way you put that, the neighbor to the north. <laughs> okay, well, you're watching the Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest today is Ambassador James F. Moriarty. We're going to take a break. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Aloha, Yappers. This is your host, King Zilli, for The Yap Show. Every Friday, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, you can catch us here live, Think Tech Hawaii. And then later on, we upload to our YouTube channel. We talk about youth issues, policies, uh, youth programs, and how to transition yourself into adulthood. But this was like a sign, I guess. Hey, like, like, hey, right. now's your chance to go back to school, which uh, I'm doing. Catch us here again live, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our guest today is Ambassador James F. Moriarty. Our topic is uh, make it the Indo-Pacific region, and we're talking about ways in which the United States might re-envision um, the entirety of Asia to enhance uh, the success of U.S. Uh, policy. 
during the break, uh, we were talking about uh, some of the, uh, well, let's call it the traditional strategic thinking that uh, colored the area. And uh, you want to pick it up from there? Well, I was saying that uh, when India was ruled by the British, when the Indian subcontinent was British, basically the policy of the British Raj at the time was to play off its neighbors against each other, keep the neighborhood relatively weak mm -hmm. in the assumption that that would make it any, any of the neighbors less of a threat to, to British India. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of instincts like that along the way. Uh, it's having served in, in neighboring countries, a lot of the neighboring countries were uh, displeased with Indian ventures into foreign policy that seemed to intrude into their domestic affairs. Uh, I think the Indians have gotten a lot sharper and a lot more attuned to those nuances. Uh, and Modi, since he's been prime minister, has been reaching out very actively to all of the neighboring countries. Uh, hasn't gone so, so well so far with Pakistan, but mm. if you look at the other four major neighbors, mm. Uh, right now, they all seem to be charmed uh, with the way Modi is treating them uh, like real adults. Mm. And I think it's having a real benefit for Indian foreign policy right now. Mm. That, that's interesting. I, I'd like to come back to that, um, especially in the case of Sri Lanka, which we were talking about just before the show. Um, but traditionally, why hasn't the United States seen this area in a holistic fashion? Why is it just sort of I've been happy to focus on Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia and just kind of let South, South Asia just dangle. Well, I think there's probably a couple reasons. Uh, one is that, and probably the most important one, is that early on we got into uh, what generations of analysts called uh, hyphenating <laughs> South Asia. We called it uh, the Indo-Pak relationship. Or, you know, and Whenever a senior official from the U.S. went to India, he had to stop in Pakistan, mm. and vice versa. Mm. And that was because of our alliance with Pakistan, with our suspicions about India, which developed a very close, close relationship with the then Soviet Union. Right. And another reason, frankly, is it's so far away. Yeah, that's, so unless there was a problem... Was, that was my guess, yeah. Yeah, so unless there's a problem, we tend to we tended not to treat it as anything except an Indo-Pak relationship. Well, India was a very, played a very big role in the non-aligned movement. And did that just, for some time, just sort of freeze U.S. relations with India? I mean, it was so far away. It's into this non-aligned stuff. We, we have other more pressing priorities. I wouldn't overstate it, but to some degree, probably. And to, uh, uh, as I said, another factor being the aggressiveness uh, of the Indian-Pakistan relationship mm. from both sides, really. Right. But, you know, for example, the uh, country I was last in, Bangladesh, uh, was created by Pakistani mismoves, but ultimately it was the Indian army moving into what was then East Pakistan right. that dismembered a country that was a close ally of the United States. Right. And right. so that takes a few years to get over things like right. that. I remember exactly when that happened. I was following very closely. Yeah. <laughs> ah, interesting. Well, um, let's see, where was I? Okay. Let's say that we refocus our perceptions uh, on the area. We now call it the Indo-Pacific region. Are other countries with whom we've had long-standing relationship with, close relationship, are they going to feel that somehow we're turning away from them, we're somehow diluting our relationship with them? There's always this fear, it seems, with every country in Asia uh, with whom we have an alliance, for example, that we're somehow going to quickly pack up and go home, you know, turn our heads the other way and kind of leave them hanging. If we, you know, perceive the area as the Indo-Pacific region, which is huge, as we saw on the map, from the, from the Pacific all the way over to Pakistan. Are some of the other countries going to, um, you know, be upset about that, thinking that, well, they, you know, there won't be enough time for us. We won't get the due attention that we require. Um, 
that sort of thing? Well, up to now, the countries which matter the most for us have been welcoming this stretching of the definition of our rebalance. Uh, I mentioned Japan earlier, mm -hmm. uh, but Australia also is part of the reaching out sure. to, to India in a, in a big way. Mm -hmm. uh, you have trilateral talks, uh, the Japanese, the Australians, the Indians. We get involved with both, both of our partners and the Indians. Uh, the Vietnamese have been reaching out very aggressively to the Indians. The Indian-Vietnamese relationship seems to have potential, doesn't it? Absolutely. You know, the Vietnamese are always looking for, for partners and friends. And frankly, they have to be careful. You know, they, as you liked it so much before, I'll say it again, the big neighbor to the north <laughs> is sitting up there. So right. the Vietnamese have to be careful about what they do to some degree. They don't want to antagonize China mm -hmm. unnecessarily, but given China's actions, particularly in the South China sure. Sea, they want to show that they have friends. Right. And India fits the bill pretty, pretty well. Right. Uh, and again, if you look at the region as a whole, I think not just the Chinese, but the Japanese, the Koreans, realize that when you're talking about the sea lanes that are absolutely vital to all those countries' economies, they don't start at the Straits of Malacca. They start in the Indian Ocean. Turmoil in the Indian Ocean, or people using the Indian, trying to close the Indian Ocean, uh, would be very detrimental to them. And if you look at the countries in Southeast Asia, particularly the ones uh, on land, Thailand, Burma, Malaysia, What's in it for them? Well, they're looking at this in terms of greater connectivity. You know, will they see a market that increasingly is not just Southeast Asia, but also Southeast mm. South Asia? Right. Uh, another 1.7 billion people uh, added uh, to those that these countries can easily access. And, you know, when we think of countries in Northeast Asia, <clears throat> Uh, and, and I'll throw in Singapore too, and I'm not really quite sure about Malaysia, but clearly <clears throat> in recent years, Korea, South Korea, of course, Japan, Taiwan have really ramped up their investments in India. Um, there's more people-to-people -people exchanges between, all, between those countries. Mm -hmm. Singapore, I'm certain because of its large Indian community, mm -hmm. has significant investments in India. Um, Hmm. Given India's uh, prowess in certain technical areas, too, it's very attractive. It's attractive, and as I said earlier, the, uh, this is natural. It's been going on for centuries. You know, the Indian subcontinent, even before the British came and, you know, made Malaysia, Burma, Singapore uh, part of an empire that included uh, the Indian subcontinent, but even before that, you had deep patterns of trade. Uh, you know, you've probably in Indonesia seen uh, Hindu temples. Well, sure. You know, guess, sure. Guess, guess why they exist. Guess where they came from. <laughs> <laughs> guess where they came from. Um, let's see here. Um, what about structural changes? So structural changes, I should say bureaucratic changes. How about Washington? Now, the State Department has uh, the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Mm -hmm. Okay, then it has uh, South, uh, what is it, South Asia and Central Asia South Bureau. Central Asian Bureau yeah. So this would mean that the State Department would probably have to restructure itself. Is, you, you were a veteran of the State Department. Is that a bureaucratic problem? Is that something that would go on for years and years? Or is that something that could easily be accommodated? Or? Well, let's be, let me put it this way. I was, uh, I'll give you another bureaucracy. When I was okay. At, <laughs> <laughs> you give me one, I'll give you another. Okay, sure uh, enough. When I was at the National Security Council, uh, it was as special assistant to the president and senior director for Asia. Okay. And at that point, we defined Asia as all of Northeast Asia, all of Southeast Asia, and South Asia up to the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. Uh, so you're saying the, the National Security Council was kind of was ahead of the times. Was organized that way, yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, 
it was a pretty exhausting <laughs> portfolio. I mean, part of the problem is uh, when you throw in China, India, Japan, uh, you have huge interests. And so I think that you know, people in state would argue, well, you know, maybe really what you need is better coordination. And, and I've seen it. You know, I'm not going to talk inside baseball, but I, I think they're doing a better job of trying to do so. Uh, and it's partly because Secretary Clinton, when she first defined this, made it clear that the then pivot, now rebalance, really included the Indian subcontinent. Mm. Uh, and that remains the official language to this day in all of the documents, uh, whether it's you know, the, uh, the communique out of the Obama meeting with Modi last, uh, in January, or the national security strategy that came out. It's, it's gotten traction as the goal. And that, that means the question is, you know, how well do the various bureaus implement that goal? Um, Secretary Clinton, she used the terminology Indo-Pacific region. That was at the urging of Secretary, then Secretary Campbell. Was that his influence? I, I can't comment. Okay. Uh, I, I, you I, don't I do know. I do though know that my friends in the South Central Asia Bureau were, were also pushing for that. Inclusion. Oh, I see. Oh, that's very interesting. I, I know of other people in Washington that are very much into this idea, and one of them I know is Chaz Freeman. Uh, mm -hmm. In his book, uh, Interesting Times, he, he makes a big point about Indo-Pacific region, Indo-Pacific region. And uh, uh, I, I've, I recall correctly, he spent one tour in South Asia. I think it was his very first tour in the State Department. Um, but he, he seems to push that very hard. Well, like I said, it makes sense, and it's becoming possible. I mean, for many years, if you just look at the issue of connectivity, you had this black hole called Myanmar, Burma. Right, right. Where, you know, they weren't going to approve roads connecting Southeast Asia to, to India, or particularly through Bangladesh. There was just, you know, a, a physical inability to make this thing work, at least on the land level. Uh, there also was a question of Indian capacity and mm. Indian willingness to do much, to bear much of a load. Right. Uh, so right now you're seeing a lot of things falling into place, while at the same time uh, the perception of China as being an increasingly assertive power in the region makes everybody think, well, you know, this has to take off to some degree. Right. You know, the region has to work together. It, it seems like, and you suggested that the PACON, the way PACON structured, it, it could accommodate this change pretty easily. Or maybe it, it, it really is accommodating it already. Um, it, CENTCOM is Central Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, PACOM's uh, area of operations goes up to, well, I don't, it doesn't include Pakistan. No, Pakistan's it's India, Pakistan Pakistan border. Yeah. So in that sense, PACOM probably could adjust fairly easily. Yeah, and it does have expertise that, uh, within itself uh, that can address Indian Ocean issues, and, they, and they've realized that it's an, impo an increasingly important part of what they do. Mm. So yeah, in, in that sense, uh, if you want to look at an organization ahead of its time, maybe, maybe that's one, because it's been doing it for a long time. Right, and it sounds like the National Security Council is, is ahead of the times, too. It's, uh, State Department might have to make a couple of adjustments. Well, we, we, we stopped after. Uh, the National Security Council stopped that after a few years just because of the press of work. Oh, so they would have to go back and make some changes yeah. too. You're watching uh, Think Tech Asia. My name is Bill Sharp. I'm your host today. And um, our guest is uh, James F. Moriarty. Uh, I am Ambassador Moriarty served as a U.S. Ambassador to Nepal and Bangladesh. And we've been discussing ways in which the United States might re-envision uh, the entirety of Asia and look at it more as the Indo-Pacific region rather than just the East Asia Pacific region. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Seymour Kazimersky. I have a show called Seymour's World on ThinkTech Hawaii. Our show is about opening minds and facilitating conversations. To tell you the truth, I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. I have no idea who our guests are going to be, but I guarantee you we're going to have lots and lots of fun. Aloha from Seymour's World.
Aloha, my name is Paul Jackson, better known as PJ, and my local interest is in sports. I have my own sports radio show at KWAI AM 1080 that you can stream live. I also have my own website, pjsportsradio.com. We have live guests in studio, and we talk about discussions and topics that everyone wants to know locally here on the islands. We cover everything from surfing to basketball to whatever's going on locally, sports-wise. We try to do our best and cover the topics in depth as much as we can. Once again, thank you for joining PJ here on Hawaii Sports Update. Mahalo. Welcome back. Uh, I'm your host, Bill Sharp. You're watching Think Tech Asia. Uh, our guest today is uh, Ambassador James F. Moriarty, uh, who served as U.S. Ambassador to Nepal and Bangladesh. We've been discussing ways in which the United States might re-envision the, the region, Asia, in order to enhance its uh, policy uh, uh, effectiveness there. Um, might it better refer to the area as the Indo-Pacific region? Well, OK, this notion of the string of pearls uh, and, and the whole thing about the, you know, um, China's, you know, maritime Silk Road uh, and the way it's building bases all around the Indian Ocean uh, in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka. There's talk of a sub base in the Maldives. And for a few years now, they've been building a well, it depends on your perspective, a commercial port or a naval port in Pakistan. What's your take on all of this? Well, if you look at what the Chinese say, they obviously attach great importance to the safety of their lines of communication to the Middle East. Uh, they are very dependent on trade in general, but they're all particularly dependent on the flow of resources through the Indian Ocean. So in that sense, you can come up with a strategic argument that they are doing something. If you look at it closely, maybe it's there, maybe it's not. Uh, you know, this Bangladesh exercise that keeps on getting cited, nobody's put any money into it. Uh, mm. And so we'll, we'll see if that ever comes about. The Sri Lankan port was built on commercial terms by the Chinese, and they made a lot of money out of it. Mm. Uh, but you know, they do have a degree of control over the facility. I think that's what makes people nervous. It makes the Indians particularly nervous. Uh, the Indians have always assumed that they're the predominant power in the region. Mm -hmm. They'll say, hey, look at the name of that ocean. Right, right, you know, right, right. Basically, right, right. it's ours. And everything on its periphery should work through us in, in conjunction and cooperation with us. And so they see, uh, Chinese submarines pulling into Sri Lanka and they get nervous uh, because it wasn't done with their knowledge or their approval and it was done at a part of a base that isn't controlled by the Sri Lankans. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, uh, that probably ramps up fears to a degree uh, that are not justified at this point but as they say even paranoids have enemies. Uh, that's what you're seeing right now in the Indian Ocean is an India that's increasingly worried that China, to some degree, is, has an active strategy of trying to control the ocean. And to do that, it needs to encircle uh, India. Mm. Uh, frankly, I don't think the Chinese have the power to do that. But you know, I think those are the fears that uh, India holds deep in its heart. You mentioned that in a lot of the aid projects that um, China um, carried out in Sri Lanka that actually made quite a bit of money and perhaps the the prices were far higher than they should have been. Can you explain that? Well, a lot of times when people say that uh, China is giving this much money to a country, uh, we in the West assume that it's like much of Western aid, which is grant aid, mm -hmm. and which means it's, it's a gift. We're giving you money. Uh, much of what China does in terms of these supposed grants to country are actually loans. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Sri Lanka, apparently a lot of the loans were at commercial rates. Uh, the, mm. the international development banks will loan money at less than 1%. Okay, And they'll usually do it with a grace period, in other words, a period when the country doesn't have to repay of any place from 10 to 20 years 
at which point they start paying this very low interest rate and the principal. Uh, the Chinese are basically commercial. We lend you the money, you start paying it back to us, and we charge you a, a commercial rate, which I think is r roughly 3 to 4%. So it's, mm. it's much more expensive money. And then there are these allegations. You know, the Sri Lankans have been saying that uh, some of the roads that have been built per kilometer were roughly five to six times uh, the cost of comparable roads built without Chinese money or Chinese companies involved. So those allegations are out there. They're out there in other countries, too. I, I saw or I heard similar allegations while I was in Bangladesh. About Chinese similar Chinese projects, but in other countries like in Africa, where yes, they're you know, heavily where, invested. Where you are paying commercial rates, the Chinese bring in their own people to build the roads, uh, and the assumption is that there is corruption involved. Mm. Uh, otherwise, why would you pay that much money for a road? Mm. Uh, do you have any read on the quality of Chinese construction work? They can do fine construction, but in many instances, uh, it hasn't been up to par. You know, they can, if they put their minds to it, they can do fine. But uh, particularly in developing countries, uh, there seems to be a record of, of fairly shoddy workmanship. When I was in Bangladesh, uh, there was an, a news story came out that a Chinese company that had been banned from doing work in Bangladesh for five years, four years earlier, uh, was going to be begin building a large road project, and it got out in the papers. There was a, a huge outcry, and mm. at that point, the contract got canceled. And basically, the uh, the company had done such a bad job of building another road that they had got, gotten the contract for inside Bangladesh that the previous government, the BNP government, uh, which had awarded the contract, right. had to acknowledge that this this didn't meet the standard. That's a really interesting. One reason I, I ask that question is because in China, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen this too, there's so many you know, new condo complexes that have gone up and high rises. And, uh, um, and I, I see that um, some of these places I visited a few times because friends of mine live there. And they're new places, five or six or seven years old, and you see an unprecedented amount of deterioration for a building that's so new, so new. Yeah. and um, so I, I can't help but think that sometimes the Chinese are a little bit interested in doing things fast mm -hmm. and as a result cut some corners and that's reflected in the quality. Well, on the other hand, as you said, there's the, they can build very good stuff too. Mm -hmm. They can. Um, hmm, that's really interesting. I, I was not aware of that in Sri Lanka. I mean, I know the, and that one road that leads from the airport to Colombo, which the uh, Chinese build, everybody's very, very proud of that because it's the best piece of freeway in all of Sri Lanka. Five or ten years from now, I'm not sure what condition it'll be in, but it's pretty good right now. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Well, what about the election in Sri Lanka? Um, what, what's your take on that, the recent election, which seemed to be a pretty uh, pivotal, there we go, pivotal. <laughs> um, Monumental <laughs> election. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I think it brought a lot of hope to the people of Sri Lanka, and it brought a lot of hope to the friends of Sri Lanka outside. Mm. And frankly, it will make U.S. relations with Sri Lanka, I think, much easier than they have been recently. Uh, the previous government uh, really took great offense at the West, saying that there had to be an investigation into the allegations of massive loss of life at the end of the Civil War. Uh, and, you know, a close relationship with China, that's not necessarily anti-Western, but at the same time, the Sri Lankans in many ways were pulling back to some degree uh, from the relationship with the West. Mm. I say it will help the people of Sri Lanka because I think uh, one thing we have to stress, first of all, is that the victory was stunning. Mm -hmm. Nobody predicted this right. a month before. Right. Uh, and if you look at why it happened, I think it happened because the average voter in Sri Lanka was worried. They saw a family dynasty that seemed to be trying to entrench itself 
uh, they saw increasing rights abuses, right. increasing attempts to muzzle the press. Mm -hmm. And the Indian, uh, excuse me, the Sri Lankans are very proud of their democratic heritage. Throughout the 25 year uh, civil war, they continued to hold elections, governments continued to change. And the idea of one family trying to set the rules of the game so that that family continued to run Sri Lanka into the indefinite future made the average voter uncomfortable. Mm. And now you have a new president uh, who has come in with a pretty ambitious plan, a 100-day program trying to change the way Sri Lanka does business, uh, trying to open things up, trying to really push reconciliation with the Tamils. And that gets back to the, in my book, the, the biggest unaddressed question, which is, you know, the previous government won the Civil War, but could they win the peace? Could they bring the Good Tamils, question. the 20%, back into the mainstream? One thing that I, I don't quite understand, and maybe you can help me out, because you certainly, um, you know, spent a, a considerable amount of time in South Asia. There seems to be a very, I don't know if it's close, but highly workable relationship between Pakistan and Sri Lanka. I really don't quite understand the dynamics of that. Oh, can you help me out on that? Well, there, there's a couple things going there. Uh, they had a a close military to military relationship. Mm. You know, the uh, Sri Lankan military cooperated with the Pak military in a, mm -hmm. in, in a number of areas. There's also a uh, something that most people aren't aware of, which was there was a close relationship between the textile and ready-made garment industries in the two countries. Oh. A, a lot of talent from Sri Lanka, which started fairly early on and developed fairly quickly, helped in Pakistan. Oh, I then you see. also had the tea trade, and yeah, you know, there were just a lot of individual strands that tied two countries that seemed very different in a lot of ways well, yeah, together. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people to people and business ties, and like I said, this uh, strange little military tie uh, that continued on for decades. At least a certain part of the population in Sri Lanka is Muslim, and of course, Pakistan is entirely a Muslim country. Uh, does that factor into it at all? Well, since we have a segment of our population that's Muslim, we better have good relations with uh, a Muslim country. Maybe that's a little too simple. Yeah, I haven't seen that much. You know, maybe that's a little bit of a factor, but frankly, the Muslims have been so far on the outs in Sri Lanka that okay. you know, you're not sure. Maybe, but probably not a huge factor. Okay. Yeah, minor at best. Minor at best. Well, um, Maldives, any take on the Maldives? So I, we're going around the horn here yeah, in South I'm, Asia. Uh, I, I think you're probably much better informed than I am on the Maldives. Uh, it is a country that, if, like several in uh, South Asia, continues to be roiled by political instability. Mm. And uh, the feelings are strong. It's it, For a country that small, it's incredibly complicated. Right. You know, the, uh, when you have islands all over the place, a weak central government, uh, histories of smuggling, uh, and histories of large degree of autonomy, it's hard for any central government to assert its authority. And it's easy for those in opposition to play off that weakness. And, and that's what you've seen uh, over the past decade. Great. Well, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you very much for uh, um, giving us the benefit of your experience and your wisdom. And we'll see everybody right here next week. Thanks, Thanks for viewing. Thank you, Bill. It's been great being here. Thank you.